My name is uh, Matej Zecevic, and, and thanks to you guys for, for having me over here at the Lisp Lab in, in Dathmal College. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about neurocausal and symbolic AI. Um, the cause and the symbolic is, is, is the bigger part for me here now, but obviously there's this neural component, um, but I put it a little bit smaller here in the title because I think <laughs> that the, the center piece will be these two, but uh, still we will also discuss that, of course. Um, but before I start, I, I think uh, I really want to highlight um, that I, I feel honored also to to be in this kind of historic environment. Uh, you probably expected me to mention this, maybe. Uh, I guess you, you yeah. hear this often. Um, but uh, yeah, if you Google the birthplace of AI, of course, that mouth is uh, kind of to come up first because in 1956 we had this yeah big event the, the birth uh, of on its field right so every one of us yeah. is working in here and is somehow passionate about it and right. um actually i found this photo here which which i think uh -huh. is pretty nice uh, uh -huh. shows all of these big personalities right um i mean marvin minsky back then from mit claude shannon from you know information theory and so on and so forth um and yeah this is kind of where artificial intelligence uh, as a term i guess was also coined back then by john mccarthy which is here right right next to Claude Shannon um yep. but what I what I want to do here is um really kind of extending this picture now yeah so because <laughs> AI is actually developing right and 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 we are yeah. going to talk about neural and causal today as well and so mm -hmm. um I'm just picking some representatives here of course there's many more maybe not too many because it's still some kind of this legendary view of 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 some heroes right um, but certainly some pioneers, right? So when we talk about causal, especially for computer science, it's it's Judah Pearl. If we think of neural, right, then, then we have someone like Rosenblatt who pioneered the MLP, but even Schmidt Huber and all the godfathers of deep learning who who really made a push for for these uh, uh, deep models and and make uh, neural models uh, bear their fruits. So so you can see they are also in black and white sitting in the same lawn as as the others <laughs> for the for the moment. Yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, just to my person, so that you have a little bit of a context, so, so kind of my training in affiliation. So, so I'm a bit trained in computer science. I, I did both my bachelor's and my master's in computer science. So for us here in Germany, it's actually a bit different. So, um, you know, you have to do actually a master's um, as a kind of requirement to even start your PhD. So it's not like you start your PhD and then in the first year or so do your master's. So in that oh, sense, I, I might be considered to be in a fourth year. Um, uh -huh. wow. And I, I, I did the... Um, yeah, so some some research internships and 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 actually also my 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 thesis both for bachelor's and master's at at the Max Planck Institute. So so some of you who know Germany and the research environment, uh, these are you know specialized in, institutes for certain topics. So I dabbled a little bit in neuroscience, but also in the one which is famous for causality. So um, that's kind of my background. So the Max Planck in Tübingen is known for uh, causality. Correct. Correct. Oh, got it. Got it. Okay. Correct. The yeah, Tübingen also has a really good uh, math department. I have some of my math colleagues uh, uh, at Tübingen. Oh, oh yeah, I mean Philip Henning and 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 all these other guys. I mean they're they're pretty amazing actually. Yeah. So. Yeah. Hundred uh, percent. I I definitely agree. Um, and in Tübingen also, while we are being at it, uh, it's a small place, but it's very lovely. So so I can only recommend uh, visiting. Um, yeah. But if you come to to Darmstadt or Frankfurt, uh, feel feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you are more than welcome there, of course, as well. And I think it's even beautiful. Of course, oh, I'm bi wow. biased because I, I am there, but yeah. <laughs> um, another thing just from my side, so, so I have like this, this personal website where I kind of, you know, keep open access articles on, on all kinds of topics and mostly nerdy topics. But as you can see, I also write about sports or whatever. And I have a Twitter. So, so if you want to stay con connected in that kind of sense, uh, please feel free to do so. Yeah, uh, how did this all start, right? So, so I got contacted, um, and and I, I got uh, reached out with the fact that you know you guys are very interested in this kind of uh, neural causal symbolic uh, workshop that we are organized, uh, this NCSI workshop. And so, really, what I want to do is uh, this workshop was happening at Neurips last year. Um, I would it was a purely virtual workshop. I mean, we did it on purpose because. You know, going to the US is not easy for everyone. And so so we want to kind of be inclusive. Um, and it also made it a little bit easier for us in this case, because we were traveling, especially I was traveling last year a lot. So 
Um, and yeah, so so I, I just want to briefly take you back to this workshop, but all the content wow. is actually available now publicly, so so you can really just access it. It's like eight, nine hours worth of workshop. We had keynote speakers, we had orals, we had panel discussions. It was very nice, all, 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 right. all in all. Yeah. So, so yeah, there's these kind of three components that you have here, right? The neuro, the causal, and symbolic. I've color coded them here also with the design of the slides. So really just going uh -huh. through each of them for a second. So, so if you go into the neural part, then what I've taken here is kind of this, you know, Vaswani et al. paper, uh, this, this attention paper, right? I mean, the transformer yeah. thing and the pre-trained transformer thing for ChatGPT, for GPT-4. I mean, it's all over the news. Um, and, and really what it just goes on to show again, that we can have these monolithic approaches, right? These like end-to-end -end trainable things, uh, which, which just enable incredible function approximation on, on a scale that, that we cannot fathom. Right. And then as soon as we get this achievement, we are like, oh, it was not that special, but in just the narrow AI sense, it's, it's actually incredible. And, and wow. we've seen already countless applications to it. So, so that's really what I, what I call the neural part here. Then for the causal part, um, this is kind of the area where I'm most focused in. Um, it's really about this, you know, what we consider to be a, a central aspect of human cognition, actually, right? So, so it's really um, something that we we do daily and, and we do even unconsciously. Um, and, and it's no surprise that it becomes central to science, to engineering, to business, to law, right? Like, uh, you know, a, a jury might ask, okay, is is would this same outcome ha had happened if 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 the the person was in a different kind of condition, right? And and all these kind of considerations go into play. And and if we, if we talk about you know language and and how we formalize these kind of things or or formulate these things rather, then it's this what if and why kind of questions, right? Questions of attribution, questions of uh, change, essentially. And and really, what we hope with causality is to to have these kinds of things in there because it's clear that we kind of want to have them in, in there because these are you know awesome capabilities it's just a question of how to get there and what you see here on the left side is this uh, famous depiction from the book of why from pearl um on kind of this ladder of causation uh and 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 and, and prominently you know current ai systems depicted by the robot would be on the first rung and and someone mm -hmm. like albert einstein who's you know, envisioning greater things is, is actually on the highest rung, which is what, what we call imagining, which is all about counterfactual querying. Yeah. Then the symbolic part to me really is, so I've taken this this uh, work from Ahmed et al from, from the Star AI lab in, in, uh, at UCLA. And, and to me, it's really about this these reasoning capabilities, right? Like um, that, that we have, for example, here on the left-hand side, we have kind of this, this logic circuit and uh, we are using it kind of to um, um, improve on a neural part in this case. This is actually a neurosymbolic work. It's, it's from the, I think this is the semantic loss paper. And uh, really what it, what it allows you is to, to, to both give guarantees, but also, you know, have a certain degree of interpretability. And, and, and these are kind of key aspects that you have on the symbolic aspect. And so we want to have all these three things. We are going back now to this talk. So that other thing was the nearest workshop, but now a quick overview. So, so first I want to really just briefly discuss how we could maybe use symbolic algorithms for causal inference. So, so we are doing this one-way combination. Mm -hmm. Then in the second part, I want to talk about, you know, how we can actually find causal meaning or, or, or whether something is already causal in both symbolic approaches. I'll take the example of linear programs but also in, in neural approaches. So, so more specifically deep learning, geometric deep learning, especially. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I want to ask the questions about, you know, objective functions that might lead to causality, right? So, so can we, can we have, you know, our neurosymbolic setup or, or just our symbolic setup? Can we formulate objective functions that make things more causal in a sense, right? Like as a kind of objective driven approach. So these are kind of the three things I want to discuss now in this talk specifically. And again, as always, like we can we can talk, we can discuss at any point in time. Um, but it's also fine if you only have questions at the end. Uh, um, do as you please. Um, really, just a, a kind of too long did not read. So, so what you're going to see is that we've really already found some so interesting and creative angles for tackling uh, this, this problem. This you know having a kind of sensible integration of 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 these different aspects. And mm -hmm. I think the main message is really let's enjoy and, and simply keep doing this research, right? And um, as Professor Chin was always saying, 
I think you know doing this together in a, in a collaborative and, and and awesome environment is is always uh, the best way. I, I personally that that's my uh, credo. Also, short disclaimer. So uh, again, I've, I'm giving this talk for the first time, so um, I might be going a little bit fast at some points, just you know to keep some kind of sensible timing. Um, and, and, and there's also a lot of content to come. So, so the goal is not really a single in-depth discussion about any, but rather this overview so that you kind of grasp an intuition. This is kind of my goal of this talk, right? And um, yeah, uh, so, so don't, don't worry if, if, if it's too fast at some, some point or whatever, we can always take the discussion offline and at some later point, right? So, so always feel free to reach out to me. So the first chapter, so using symbolic algorithms for causal inference. Here, I want to talk about a work which appeared at our workshop, actually. It was published at our workshop, and it's not a work done by me. So, so the other works you'll see will be works where I'm affiliated. This one I'm not, but I'm, I'm going to present it because I, I think it's it's pretty nice. It's also interesting because, unfortunately, this, this talk didn't get an oral, um, but still, I think it, it perfectly resembled kind of the goal of the workshop. So this is work from, from uh, Benji Wang and, and Marta uh, Kwiatkowska from, from Oxford. And um, the title of this paper was Symbolic Causal Inference via Operations on Probabilistic Circuits. So, so there's already a lot of, to digest. So there's going to be a lot of you know, groundwork um, for, for several of these uh, papers and, and things that I'm going to discuss. I'll try to have pointers and, and kind of references here and there. Um, but again, don't, don't worry, right? These are respective fields, right? And and I can always answer questions or, or go deeper, um, but really it's it's about you grasping kind of these these basic ideas. And so so really what they are kind of doing um, is, is is using some symbolic operations which they formalize in probabilistic circuits to actually do causality to do causal inference. Um, just quickly, causal inference one on one. I was warned before that uh, you know uh, it would be nice to to also have some some you know basic intuition on these concepts and so. I'm trying to do that. And um, yeah, at, at the centerpiece, really, uh, model. Um, really what it is, it's, it's, it's a collection of mechanism, of mechanism that we call causal mechanism. And essentially, you can just think of it as, as in a computer program when, when you have a function which then is, you know, evaluated and saved into a variable. And really, that's what, what's happening, right? So... Uh, mm -hmm. If you say that, you know, temperature is, is a property you're measuring in, in degrees Celsius and, and, and you're also measuring the height of an, al you know, of, of a mountain uh, in meters, you know, the altitude, uh, then there's clearly a causal mechanism between the altitude and the temperature and, you know, going higher up in altitude will decrease the temperature. And these Fi, these are the functions, right, which, which actually dictate that. So the physical mechanisms. Um, a key concept also in causality is that of intervention so that you can actually actively change something. So you can replace these mechanisms and you can replace them by constants. You can replace them by, by uh, uh, other functions. You can replace them by uh, other functions which uh, have the restriction that they use the same parents. So, so there's really a lot of flexi uh, flexibility in this whole formalism. Um, and I think what's really nice about these models as well is that uh, while you have these, what we call uh, exogenous, uh, endogenous variables, so, so variables which actually have a name, something like altitude and temperature, there's also these exogenous variables. So these U terms that you see here, which uh, really denote everything which is unmodeled in a sense, right? So mm -hmm. they are these things that uh, are there, but we don't know about. And so, so we just give them a probability distribution. So to, to kind of, you know, depict the kind of noise, something we, we are simply not aware of. And um, an important view on devaluation. So if you really want to get the causal effect of something, then really what it is doing is looking at all the worlds which are consistent with that intervention and, and collecting um, all these different you know, details, these U terms, these U instantiations. Um, but again, if, if this is too fast, don't worry. Um, it's really just important. There's structural causal models, there's interventions, and, and, and we can actually evaluate these things. Um, another important view, so, so we already saw the teaser here from the slides before from the workshop. So on the left-hand side, you see this causal hierarchy. And so on, on the first level, we have usual statistics, essentially, right? So, so any kind of predictive thing you can get from base rule, right? So conditionals, marginals, 
the joint distribution, whatever. And really, it's it's about you know seeing or observing, right? It's it's like a an owl who's chasing a mouse, for instance, um, and 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 trying to predict, given you know the current location of the mouse, where will it be next? Yeah. So so these are already amazing tools, but this is actually only the first rung. If you go on the second and the third rung, these are what we call the causal rungs, and and they have to do with intervention. So the second run is really just a pure intervention, and you see this Neanderthal or the baby, right? Like, uh, you know, a baby will knock something off the table or or a toddler, right? And uh, through that, figure out what is happening eventually, right? Get an understanding of basic physics uh, without having actually to to know any formulas anymore. And then in counterfactuals, they also involve interventions, but they are retrospective in nature. So so we have already observed an outcome, and now we are kind of in this mental space, and we are doing an intervention. So so we are reflecting, and that's why we call it uh, imagining. Yeah. So um, and and an amazing result that you know the literature has come about is 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 what you see on the right hand side. This, uh, you know, on, on Pearl's causal hierarchy and, and the foundations of causal inference, um, it's, it's essentially a proof of the fact that the boundaries between these rungs, uh, they actually exist and they are solid. So, so you cannot really go from one to two or from two to three. It's always underdetermined. And um, in a sense, it seems first sobering, um, but actually it really just tells you that causality makes sense. And um, it's not hopeless. Uh, it's just that if you don't have any other assumptions um, available, then then you can really not do this cross layer inference. But if you have if you have those, or if you're willing to make those, then you can actually do this. And and that's the most amazing part here. So also some pointers. Um, I can also gladly share the slides with you afterwards. So so you can really also dig into these ref uh, references that I have here. Um, of course, there's these standard books by by Pearl, but also by Peter Sadal from the Tübingen crew. Um, but there's also some nice lectures and on, online courses. And also there's uh, hands-on code tutorials. So, so here are two code tutorials in which I was involved. Um, so, so you can also play around with it. Okay, going back now to this paper by Benji Wang and, 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 and Marta. So mm -hmm. um, we are talking about these two, two graphs here, or, or they are talking about these two graphs in, in their paper. And so, so you have these three variables, X, Y, and Z, and they, you know, they can be multidimensional, it doesn't really matter. On the left-hand side, you have this famous backdoor graph. We call it backdoor because usually we are interested in the effect of X on Y. So imagine X is a treatment and, and Y is the outcome uh, for that treatment of a patient. Uh, then we not want to know how this drug or whatever is actually affecting uh, the patient. And it's called backdoor because there's this, this, this reverse edge uh, pointing from Z to X, which uh, is the back door. It allows for information actually to flow. Um, and, and on the right-hand side, we see this so-called front door graph. So the dashed edge is, is, is just indicating that there's a hidden confounder. So essentially like on the left-hand side with the Z, but what is more important is actually that we have here a media mediator variable. So, so there's a Z in the middle, which is uh, completely mediating the effect from X to Y. And, and that's what you call a front door graph. And the query that we're interested in, the so-called causal effects, is really this quantity which is written here. So it's the probability of, of Y um, under the intervention X. So, so when you set X to, 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 to some, some specific value or to some specific function, um, and that's kind of denoted by this, this thing. And um, from causality literature, actually, we, we have a calculus for, for getting these quantities fully when, when we have the graph given. In this case, whether this is the true graph of the problem or not is not a question, but it's really about um, you know, um, uh, having, having, having the belief that this is the graph. And so you can do something which is called adjustment, uh, which in this case, if we look, for example, at this uh, backdoor graph, is really looking at this conditional, y given x and z, um, and then you know, times the probability of just observing z, and marginalizing out Z. So it's really just an expectation over this conditional. And, and this just works because it's that graph. So if we had the graph on the right-hand side, for instance, then we actually need the formula on the right-hand side, which is a slightly more complicated. Um, and, and really the amazing feat here is that by assuming this graph structure, we can actually go for something where you actually have to actively intervene on. So, so to, to really find out the causal effect, you would have to or you would believe that you have to give the patients the drug and see simply what is happening. But the quantities you see on the right-hand side of the equality sign, they are telling you 
they are purely statistics. So, so you can get them from observational data only. So you never have to right. give anyone the drug. And so that's that's really the incredible part here. And so now going back to kind of the main topic of, of, of their paper. So they are looking at these two graphs and they find out that uh, this, what you see here now again is the formula for the backdoor adjustment that it's actually intractable. So, so you can use these, these special uh, circuits, these logic circuits, <laughs> Um, and, and they found out it's, it's sharp P hard, right? So it's not even NP hard. So you actually have to count everything. So it's even sharp P hard. It's even worse. And, and even though you have like a decomposable and smooth circuit, these are like nice properties about circuits, which don't need to hold in the first place. And even then it's, it's a problem. And so that was kind of the big motivation. They, they discovered this, they want to tackle this. And before we go there, just a quick reminder, right? So, so from the theoretical computer science, I mean, there's a whole zoo of, of these different complexity classes, right? And, and, and when we write something like a problem is uh, hard, then what we really mean is that this problem kind of solves, uh, you know, all of, all of the related problems in that class. So, and, and if that problem also is in that class, then, then we usually call it MP complete, for instance, or, or you know, sharp P complete. And when we talk about tractability, then, really what, what the definition is telling you is that it's about exact computation. So, so you have some kind of query for some kind of model family. And essentially this query uh, for, any, for any model in that family, you want to exactly compute the answer in polynomial time in the size of, of this model. And mm -hmm. obviously polynomial is, is, is kind of large. I mean, it could be something like cubic. It could even be linear, but it could also be some high degree, right? So it could be very bad, right? Uh, funnily enough, it usually ends up being something like cubic or whatever because of you know matrix, matrix multiplication and these kind of things. Um, but really, that's kind of the definition of tractability here. And we actually know from you know probabilistic graphical models, something like for example Bayesian nets already in 1990s, that actually exact marginal inference is sharply hard. And uh, even if we say okay, we don't care about you know these exact marginals, we say like yeah, we we give the the slack of of being approximate. Uh, it's still NP hard, right? So, so we have like these big problems. We have like these amazing, semantically meaningful networks, which which are great. And and don't get me wrong, they have been scaled to 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 very large systems, but it's still uh, not efficient. And um, there has then been this counter movement only you know recently that the last decade with these so called sum product networks, yeah? and 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 they are a special type of neural net, essentially, which have proper probabilistic meaning, and they actually have linear time inference, right. So so they kind of lose the semantic meaning from a Bayesian net, because they are computational graph, but they are super efficient. And, and you can see so, so you have like these nodes, like these sum nodes, these plus nodes, and they, you know, uh, denote essentially to get mixtures of these probabilities distributions on the leaves, which are the variables, right? So for example, here, x1, x2, or x3. And actually it scales in the size of the network and the network doesn't blow up exponentially or anything. So that's pretty nice. And so now going back to, to what Benji is trying to do, um, we have again on the left-hand side, this vector adjustment formula, which I've seen. And, and now you can you know have this kind of symbolic computation graph on the right-hand side. So you can see on the top, we have this causal effect of x on y. And, and how do we get there, right? And, and, and essentially this formula, which you have on the right-hand side of the uh, uh, equality is, is really decomposed into this symbolic graph on the right-hand side. And, and by doing so, they could identify specific properties that circuits would additionally need to make this tractable. And this is what they did. And, and these properties are called, you know, structured decomposability and strong determinism. Again, we don't have to go into them, but this is how the circuit could look like. Again, you see the pluses and 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 and, and the axis for for the sum and product nodes. You have at the leaves again the, the variables. In this case, we have a binary setup, so so you have like y and and y negated and x and x negated. And the awesome result that they get is that if you have these additional uh, you know uh, assumptions, then um, it actually is tractable and it's actually even quadratic. Which is which is super nice, as we can see because you know the front of formula we saw earlier it's a bit more complex. That one ends up being cubic, but even that is tractable and and a great great result compared to the sharp P hat we had earlier. So in summary, for this kind of first block that we just seen, um, it's really that we have used this kind of symbolic approach to inference 
for boosting the speed of causal inference. And I think that's already amazing and really a testament to, yeah, we can actually have like a, a, a proper integration of the two, that they, they, they are not exclusive. Maybe also as a side note, we can even consider causality itself already as a symbolic approach, right? Because we, we have symbols, we have these uh, endogenous variables um, and, and it's even a graphical approach. Um, but then again, mostly when we are talking about, you know, symbolic, neurosymbolic and causal, we are really thinking of, I guess, these different methods from, 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 from logic, from expert systems, from, from the new dawn of combining neural and symbolic ones with the causal aspect. So now I want to move on to the second chapter, which is, you know, finding causality in symbolic and neural methods. So now it's more or less kind of the, the other way around. And we're going to start with the symbolic part. And for this, uh, we are going to talk about this paper, which was published at the Eichley workshop on object structure and causality, um, with the very fitting name of finding structure and causality in linear programs. So, so at first, one, one might be um, surprised to see, you know, causality and, and, and kind of linear programs to appear in the same same, same sentence. Uh, but really, what, what this paper is trying to argue is that it actually makes sense. So what we see here now is on the left hand side just a like schematic depiction of, of linear program in two dimensions so we have like these two decision variables x1 and x2 we have a cost vector c which is kind of dictating where we want to push our solution the star with the s is indicating that optimal solution and the phi is uh, defining the the polytope it's 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 really the the, the space of, of feasible solution of your linear program and now what you can do is you can view using the formalism of causality and the graphical approaches, you can kind of view this thing as a, as a causal graph, right? I call this now here the LP causal graph. And so we have, again, the three variables, the phi, the X, the C, and also the S, actually four variables. And, and we can have this kind of general picture, right? So where, where the causal mechanism is really just the solver, right? It's, it's giving you the, the solution. And now you see these kind of green arrows, right? So the ones pointing from, from, from the constraints to themselves, the ones pointing from the decision variables to themselves, but also the ones from the constraints to the solution. And really what we are arguing here is that these kind of corresponds to different settings of, you know, uh, causal discovery essentially, right? So there's these different relation types of interest. And, you know, if we look at X, that's kind of classical causal discovery. You are always trying to, you know, given your observational or mixed data, you are trying to infer which variable is the cause of the other. Um, mm -hmm. But the other ones are a bit more special, right? They are kind of like parameter to parameter, like how do the constraints themselves, you know, uh, relate to each other and affect each other, actually. Um, but the other one is also like parameter to solution. How do the constraints actually dictate what kind of solution you can actually see? So here I have like a simple example in your program. So, so we again have two, two variables. So one is denoting the, the pizza consumption. The other one is denoting uh, the salad consumption. And the constraints also have meaning, right? And, and that was kind of the motivation for looking at this in the first place. So uh, one of the constraints is, is something about like micronutrients, right? Like uh, all, the, all, the, all the vitamins, for instance, uh, you'll find. And, 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 and surely with a, with a nice salad, you would be expecting to, to get a little bit more than pizza, right? Um, another constraint would be calories, right? And, and of course, they are also pizza is more calorie dense than, than, than salad typically. Um, and so these are sensible constraints. And so now any kind of diet, right, combination of this pizza and salad consumption will lie in this polytope somewhere and an optimal solution tries to, you know, maximize both the, the nutrients, but also, you know, the calories in this case, because this is a student, you know, who's who's hungry and, and trying to just be as efficient as possible in, in, in taking uh, food. Um, and, and, you know, just formally, right, like, you know, you typically write this as this kind of inequality of this AX uh, smaller equal than B. Um, and, 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 you know, what we see on the left hand side can, you know, with, with some numbers can, can look like this. And so what do we do here now? So actually, we won't be looking at the LP. We will be looking at data which originates from the LP. So you can imagine that there's some kind of encoding function, which is, you know, taking the LP and creating some data. And it could be something like you see here in the middle now, where you have like these different, you know, diet examples for say different students and, and green and red, are, you know, labels, which kind of encode, is it an appropriate diet or not? And that's simply dictated by whether it lies in the polytope in the constraints or not. 
So, so, you know, these red dots are, you know, way too much pizza or salad consumption, which is, you know, going over the boards with the micronutrients or the calories or both. And now what we kind of found out was you can actually now, because it's data, you can just do structure learning on it, right? You can do causal discovery in the usual sense. Uh, and actually what comes out is not gibberish. You kind of recover the original meaning of the LP, which uh, again, I mean, it, it's, it is somehow implicit in the data, but, but there's no guarantees whatsoever that this should be happening. And, and you don't look at the LP. You, you kind of feel like you're losing meaning, but you actually don't. And so, so what we find for this simple example is something like that pizza is as expected worse for an appropriate diet, right? It'll, it'll kick you out of the constraint space quicker, but also that, you know, pizza and salad balance really dictates whether the diet will be good, which also kind of makes sense intuitively. And so this really corresponds to, to our initial assumptions. And so what we did was, you know, looking at these different cases. So first we did the kind of sanity check. So what you see here is uh, these, these heat maps um, encoding, you know, the different decision variables. So here we have like five of these X's, X0 to X4. As proper computer scientists, we start with zero. And uh, Y is, you know, the, the label and, and, and just indicating whether, you know, a solution is feasible. And, and what you can see here now is that uh, what's, more, what's most important is really that we have a relation identified between the X's and Y's, right? Because obviously where your point in the space lies will dictate whether it's, you know, in the polytope or not. So, so that's good. And also if we switch the encoding, if we say like, okay, now zero is actually indicating that it's in the polytope, then you see that the, the values are actually changing. So we go from the red to the blue. So this is what kind of sent it to check that showed, yeah, this actually works. And then we kind of, you know, explore these different uh, scenarios, right? So, so in this setting, we looked for instance at, you know, the, the, the B constraint and, and the label, and, and, and we could find out, for example, that, you know, obviously the larger the Y, the larger the B. So, so it's really, you know, intuitively captioned the idea of a constraint uh, of the constraint region size. More complex, we, we had a setup where we looked almost at, yeah, we looked at actually at the, at the general LP. So, so all the cost, the A matrix, the B vector and, and, and the solution. And you can see now also like even in the, in the heat map, right? In this kind of adjacency, that, that you already have like this awesome structure. And really what it means is, is that, that you have like all these factors encoding both where the optimal solution will lie, but also uh, how the polytope actually looks like. What we also did was because linear programs are abundant in, in computer science and machine learning and uh, shortest path is, is probably one of the most prominent ones. It's an integer linear program, but that, that doesn't matter here. We, we can still make it work. And, and what you see here now on the right-hand side is, is you know, a, a problem where we're trying to go from the leftmost node to the rightmost node. And as you can see, the uh, edge X5 uh, will always be part of the shortest path because it's the only way you can get to that final node. And, and actually that one gets the strongest activation in this heat map that we have, which was also, I think, something very cool to see. So in summary, what we can say about this specific problem is that, you know, we have discovered how something which is already symbolic by construction in nature, right? And which has all these nice properties like having a meaning, you know, to the variables, to the constraints and everything um, actually bears causal semantics. You just have to look closely. The second part of the second chapter is about the deep learning aspect and specifically about geometric deep learning. And so here we have this, you know, still work in progress. We have this initial draft, which is kind of a little bit old by now. So, so we have been taking time to work on this, um, but still you can find it off archive. Um, if, if you, you know, very interested in, in, in say this or whatever, I, I can also surely send you uh, uh, the, the current draft. Um, but yeah, so, so this was about, you know, relating graph neural networks to structural causal models. Remember how I told you that in causality, they are the central thing and, and graph neural networks are a very hot topic in deep learning and geometric deep learning currently. And so we naturally ask the questions, are they related? Especially given that, you know, causal models are grounded in graphical models. And, and that's the whole idea of, of graph neural networks, having that inductive bias. So uh, just a quick recap here. So, so in this work, we, we used, you know, ideas from variational inference and obviously uh, graph neural networks. Uh, in variational inference, really just a, a su su super brief summary, um, you're kind of treating 
this this posterior inference as as an optimization problem so you're choosing a kind of what we call variational family so say a mixture of gaussian distributions and you are now trying to optimize say the kale divergence between you know this candidate that you have and, and and your posterior and actually we can do so by optimizing this this lower uh, lower bound this this evidence lower bound called elbow for short which is also very prominent in variational autoencoders. So even if you haven't experienced this your first hand, if you have used the VAE or something like that, um, then, then you have already used it. <laughs> and again, there's some pointers, uh, some nice lectures. Um, please, please feel free to check them out. For graph neural networks, on the other hand, I think it's really just important to remember that it's an inductive bias on graphs. So, so just like the convolutional network is, you know, awesome for images, um, because if you know the, the invariances that it gets for translation, rotation, and these kinds of things, um, graph neural networks are amazing for everything which is graph structures. And a lot of things in this world are graph structure. Um, and, and really, it's these permutation equivariant applications of permutation invariant functions. And it happens in a kind of message passing fashion. And, and that's what you see here at the bottom of the slide is that if you have this node i and it has all these incoming edges, then from any other node J, which is, you know, a neighbor, um, it'll compute a message together some way and, and accumulate it to, to learn a representation. And again, as always, I have some references for you. So if you're interested, feel, feel free to check them out. So how did we go on about discovering this relation between graph neural networks and SEMs? So we took inspiration from also some, some of the, you know, pioneers of this field. Uh, and there's this famous saying from 86, no causation without manipulation. We have seen earlier mm -hmm. by the work from Benji Wang that this is actually not true because if we have assumptions, we can even do it without manipulation. But generally, mm -hmm. it's capturing this idea that you know interventions are the key key thing here. And so again, what you see here, this formula, it's just written a little bit different. It's using this do operator, which you might have seen at, at some other place, which is really just indicating the intervention. And it's again the, the backdoor formula. You also see on the right hand side the backdoor graph. And um, we, we came from this perspective. We said, okay, interventions are very important uh, in causality. So can we maybe intervene on GNNs? And for that matter, we, we also had this intuition that, you know, an SCM as a collection of these, you know, different mechanisms, uh, you know, it generates data, it generates data on all these different hierarchies of the ladder of causation that we have seen earlier, but it also implies this graph structure, right? Um, and so this is a common ground with GNNs, right? So we have the graph now and we have kind of interventions. So how do we combine them? And the answer is very simply, we, we simply do the interventions and kind of cut, cut off the computational paths. And, and that's really all you need to kind of get a sensible interpretation of an intervention in a graph neural network. And so again, we looked at hard interventions, which really cut off dependence completely, um, but it's, 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 it's not, um, it's not problematic to to you know say uh, that you know without loss of generality you you could probably do even more. On on this way, kind of we we discovered you know what people call these neural causal models and and new types of these neural causal models, um, which are essentially just you know uh, the the graphs parameterized with neural models, and you can do it in different ways, right? You, you can decide to only model the variables. You can decide to 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 model each variable tuple, right? So so each of the edges essentially. Um, these are the different things. And to really summarize what we kind of did in this work is we identified these these three models on the left hand side, and we kind of classified them here in, in the sense of okay, how expressive are they in terms of their causal capabilities? Yeah, and 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 how is the training difficulty or cost? And as you can uh, easily see. Um, only this top row, the, the interventional uh, variational graph autoencoder, the IVGAE for short, um, it cannot model the complete hierarchy. It, it models just the interventions, but it is a very tractable model in, in all regards. And so that was kind of the model that we then picked on and, and tried to investigate. And, and here you see a schematic. So you see two models. At the bottom, you see a structural causal model say parameterized mid neural networks which represent these different f i j uh, f k f l and on the top you see the ivge so 
it's a variational autoencoder. So you have like these two neural networks. So it's an autoencoder and it's a variational one. It's it's a, it's a probabilistic model, and the G stands for graph, right? So so actually these functions are graph neural nets because that's what we looked at. And, and now the I just stands for interventions because it can handle interventions. And that's indicated by this do Y. And so you have these two models, but you can clearly see that they are very different. This one model is just using two, two things. And this other one is, is using four of these mechanisms. And actually the lower one scales with a number of variables while the other one will just stay constant with two. And obviously they will come with trade-offs, right? And that's what you saw earlier. So for example, the upper one can only do interventionals and it can also do it only limited. Nonetheless, it's a very compact model. It's, it's doing fast inference and it's still answering partially the, the causal queries you're looking for. And so in summary, what we can say is, you know, here you also see, you know, some estimation, but this is not as important. It's, it's really just showing you that it's working. Um, but in summary, what you can say is that, um, we have identified different conditions under which, you know, our neural models here, specifically the graph neural nets are actually causal. And so that is a, the second part to this, you know, finding causal meaning in, in, in both symbolic and neural models. Finally, to, to discuss this third and last chapter, um, are there maybe objective functions, you know, that, that lead to causality, right? And, and we could use them anyway in all our neural symbolic, neurosymbolic methods. And so this is going to be a work, uh, you know, led, led by Moritz, actually, who is also here in the talk. So, so you can also ask question, uh, answer questions if you have them. Um, so this is also a work in progress. We also had this initial draft a, a while back, um, and, and we called it this, this causal loss, you know, with, a, with hope of going from correlations to, to causation. Mm. And so the idea was really simple, right? So, you know, you could have an expert, you could have experimental data in general, anything really which can help you formulate this, this causal loss. And this causal loss will be actually a model, a, a kind of teacher model. And so, you know, it could be experimental data that we've collected and you simply trained this model. And so what we want to do now is, you know, use this model to teach another model, right? So it's a kind of communication problem. So, so it's a fair point to say, well, if you have a causal model, why do you then care about say the neural network or whatever? Um, that's a valid point. And if you have the causal model, go for it. But what we are trying to, to ask here is whether we could actually take a non-causal model and kind of make it more causal. And so we have this pipeline of, you know, you just have observational data in, in, in your predictive model. It could be a neural net, but it could also be something else. Right? So we try to be model agnostic here and, and then, you know, have this teacher model, which is this causal loss, what we call, and then model, you know, the, the, the cause distribution. And so, one way of doing this is with these so-called interventional SPNs, some product networks. So you have seen briefly earlier these some product networks consisting of these directed acyclic graphs with you know these product and sum nodes and, and the leaf nodes which denote variables. And the interventional SPN was an SPN which you know could use um so some some conditioning on information on on on, on, on a causal graph to to predict uh, a causal quantity. And and mm -hmm. and this work kind of used these models. Well, I guess simply because we had them at, as a prior work, this was a work published at NIRS in 2021, and uh, it was just a, a kind of straightforward way to go with this. And I'm going to show you an example illustration with this toy data set, which we called hidden object. So there's three objects. So you see on the left hand side, so there's this object one, object two, and then the third object, the hidden object in green. And um, this is the causal graph, the underlying structural causal model, actually, which is generating the data, which is, you know, generating these images, which are then created in Blender. As you can see on the right hand side, two examples, you always see in these images, two of these objects, the one highlighted in the blue, and then there's this third hidden one, thus giving the name. And what you can see is that, you know, S stands for shape, P stands for position, C for color, and, you know, the, the P, the C, they actually form a chain. So P1 is pointed to P2, P2 to P3, and the same for C. Um, but the S are actually a bit different. So S is actually pointing from one to three and then to two. And so what we have then here is something like this on the left-hand side, where you have like these two objects, right? So object one, object two, uh, highlighted with this golden and the green color. And say now you change the, the shape of of object two, say you make it the cylinder, like, like in this image, 
then, then obviously that's not going to have an effect on, on this hidden object that you're trying to predict. And why? Because that's just the way this data set is defined, right? That's the reality of this data set. And so now if you use a regular, you know, multilayer perceptron neural net to predict this, you know, correlational only, then if you use something like GradCam from explainable AI to visualize this, what you'll see is that the heat map will really focus on a, both of these objects. It, it's using both of these objects, right? Their shape, their color, and all these information to predict this third object. But now if we use our causal loss, right? Then what you can see is that you now have a, a bigger focus, right? So, so the focus shifts only to the single causal object, which is object one, right? Uh, don't mind the thing in the corner. That's really just uh, a validation of, of how our interventions are encoded. Um, but what is really important is that object two, the cylindric green shape, is not having that much heat activation anymore. And that's really suggesting you that kind of this neural network has, has, has picked up on, on some of this causal information from this causal teacher, in a sense. Alternate models. So I was saying we were trying to, you know, do this kind of model agnostic. And you know, what about beloved decision trees, right? These things don't get attention much, much anymore these days, but they're amazing tools. And so what you see here on the left hand side is this um Bayesian network data set called Earthquake. And it's just a simple decision uh, tree. You know, A is something like an alarm going off, right? And 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 if the alarm goes off, then you 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 might ask, oh, was there an earthquake, which is denoted by E, and so on and so forth. And we can actually apply our method to this, and and awesomely enough, you get these causal nodes, right? So the model obviously gets complex, uh, more complex. But it was not about compression; it was about you know being faithful to 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 causal questions. And by introducing these causal nodes, you 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 are actually faithful. And these are these you know red nodes here. So in summary, what you can say is that this already kind of naive objective function based on a teacher model can make both symbolic and neural approaches, right? So remember, both the decision tree and the, the standard neural network more causal in a sense. Mm -hmm. And so to give you my kind of final remarks on this, I think it's really clear that in AI, we want causal reasoning capabilities, you know, because fundamentally, we want to be able to interact with change, right? Because that's that's really something which which happens all the time. Changes are happening all the time in every regard. Every interaction with the world is is really a change of of that state of the world. And so, really, to me, it's clear being able to reason interventionally here, hypothetically, but also retrospectively, these are key concepts that that we use in, in cognition. However, I also think it's clear that you know we don't want to give up on this deep learning excellence that we have acquired, right? I mean, it's it's really just not stopping to, to surprise us. But we also really don't want to, you know, uh, just ignore all these knowledge bases and, and algorithms, you know, that we have polished over centuries, yeah, really. Yeah. I mean, it's incredible how, how, how many of these, you know, results that we have from maths, from here, from there, which which just, you know, they, they, they get proven, they get refined or so on and so forth. Think of Fermat's last theorem, right? I mean, for so many, I mean, centuries, literally, with the biggest names in mathematics from Leonard Euler, from, from Gauss, from all these guys, and, and no one solved it, right? While, while people were then starting to, to question Fermat. And then Andrew Wiles, obviously standing on shoulders of giants, provides the proof, right? And so I think right. really, we kind of want to use this. And to me, it's a question, right? Maybe there will be, like, like we like a theory of everything in physics, right? Maybe there's a unified theory or at least language, right? Of, you know, these neuro causal symbolic models. Because I really feel like it's all the same sides of, or different sides of the same coin. And, and, and really that's what I want to see. And um, wow. just a quick shout out, right? Uh, I want to thank, so, so here you can see a, pic, uh, a couple of pictures from, so, so on the left-hand side, upper left corner is my advisor, Christian Kersting. Uh, Devendra is also here in the, talk, uh, in, the in the room, I guess. Uh, Moritz as well, but also many of other amazing colleagues and collaborators. Um, yeah. Thank you so much again for having me. Thank you also so wow. for patiently listening. And um, yeah, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Wow, that <laughs> there was quite a tour of tour of force. That's, um, that's true. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I want to open it up. Uh, to questions, but uh, uh, Matek, 
uh, how much of this, um, uh, yeah, it really uh, resonated a lot with what you what you talked about, and um, I, I do think that there is, um, uh, I myself have, has a, um, have a physics and math background, so this uh, theory of everything <laughs> uh, does, does, uh, does sound very tantalizing. Um, how much of this um, can you do, um, like, are you, um, do you actually have uh, um, uh, small, like, models for uh, building blocks that you can, like, implement right now that will build up to this theory of everything? No, I, unfortunately not, not, not yet. I think everything I've sh shown today, right, I think there are already awesome ways of, of seeing how they connect, communicate and how these fields connect. Um, right. But, you know, that's what I kind of also hope, I guess, with this language is, you know, something which is maybe inherently or, or you know, synergistically already a model like that. And maybe the language is then just, you know, a kind of a, a proper justification, which, you know, can then, be, you know, maybe talk about limitations and these and that, right? If we think of something like, you know, Gödel's incompleteness theorems for, for logic or something, first of logic. Um, but um, yeah, and, and unfortunately not yet. I, I guess we, we need smart people. Maybe maybe someone from this group now after this talk <laughs> will have some idea. Well, yeah. well maybe, maybe some of us, not necessarily. I mean, maybe we can work together. for, for Maybe, maybe, on. yes. Yeah. Of course, yeah. that would be awesome. Um, yeah, that's great. Um, I want to um, open up uh, just to ask if anyone else had questions. Uh, Junya, I, I suppose you you may have some questions yourself. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, yeah, since I, I, I'm also working on this direction of neurosimulative learning. So from my research, I think uh, one biggest challenge for you know, all those kinds of neurosymbolic or causal learning methods is that um, how to uh, how to scale up, you know, scaling. A more concrete question could be, for example, in your, in the methods you showed, um, it, uh, it seems like uh, they all re uh, rely on, you know, you have to uh, design the causal model structure or the variables, you have to give one of them, either the variables, then the model find the structure by themselves, or you give a structure, then the maybe the model can find the variable based on the structure. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, is there any way to, like, like, you know, in BERT or GPT or, you know, all those uh, really popular uh, deep learning methods today, they actually based on unsupervised or self-supervised learning, um, but but it seems very intractable if you want to learn both the variables and the structure, since BERT only learn variables or rep representations. So, what do you think? Is there any way to for scaling? <laughs> yeah. Yes, that is that is an awesome question and very important question. So. Uh, funnily enough, we have recently written a grant proposal, and we hope it goes through on exact, exactly this like tractable tractable topic for causality. Um, so, where do I start? I, I think um, so. So, what you have seen also this this work from Benji Wang, but also from our group, right? On on you know doing inference tractably, right? I, I think that's already pushing it in one direction. But this other thing is of you know learning it in the first place. And just the models themselves, and so if if you look at that, then then what you quickly see is that you know if you use say you know in cause representation learning, right? When you use um, some say unsupervised approach, say a special VAE kind of approach for disentanglement, for this and that, um, you can learn useful models, but they won't guarantee you causality. And if you want to have the guarantee about causality, you have to make very weird assumptions. Let's call them like that, right? So yeah. maybe we'll get to the point where we can, you know, loosen these um, assumptions, right? And so, so we would reach there. But maybe it's also a bit of a different way. And so some colleagues also, you know, uh, from Amsterdam, they have started talking about what they call causality-inspired machine learning, right? So, so they are saying, maybe we don't need to be as strict with causality, right? Because that's a huge endeavor. Um, but maybe it's just enough to have inspiration for the learning. 
And while I think it's 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 nice and sensible, ultimately we want to have causality because that's really what gives you the robustness, the invariance, right? Um, if you talk to causal people like Judah Pearl, for instance, um, then it's clear that you know causality is a language, it's a formalism mm -hmm. grounded in probability theory, which itself is grounded in measure theory, and so on and so forth. And and it's really a language for giving you. Um, uh, yeah, an opportunity to, to express modeling assumptions. So it's inherently something which lies outside of data. And, and I guess that's the challenging part, right? Because, I mean, it was already humongous from Pearl. I mean, that's why I guess he won the Turing Award and everything to, to kind of build this language and, and, and really have it be a nice model. But now we, computer scientists, AI researchers, want to do something with it. And we realize, yeah, but how do you do it, right? And so um, I think we are, that that's kind of the challenging thing there as well, right? Like we are missing, you know, benchmarks and all these kinds of things because, well, if, if, we, if we had benchmarks, that, that would imply that we have understood causality for many different things. And, and I guess we haven't yet because, I mean, physics has taken a lot of time to, you know, do these kinds of experiments, this and that and whatever to, to, to you know, build theories, right? Like theories come up, uh, experimental theories, then you know, they, they get, you know, uh, suggest or, or they get gain evidence. Then someone comes along and long and, and shows either that there's something which is not supported by the theory or that the theory can be extended and it predicts even more, right? And so it's, it's a bigger problem in that sense. Um, yeah, I'm sorry for the long detour, but kind of that's like my, my thoughts on it off the top of my head. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, I, I, my main idea, you know, um uh most i think most neurosymbolic learning uh research are are starting usually go from neuro uh, symbolic parts or causal parts and uh, try to combine neural parts into it uh so i currently try to go from representation learning and uh, uh, it's like a bottom up instead of top down to mm -hmm. see whether we can introduce constraint or um like those function uh, in the during the training process uh now now mainly from game theory uh, to make it emerge some like log uh symbolic or logical or causal structures yes yes yeah. yes so so one more thought i could add i i think that that would be ideal in a sense you know it being say an emergent property because if you think about yourself, you know, as, as a child, right, you, you throw something off the table and, well, you don't know it's called gravity and you don't know the, you know, uh, you know, what, 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 what the, the, the actual quantities are or even the formulas in the first place, right? You learn that, if at all, a lot later, right? Um, and so it's kind of emergent, right? Like your understanding, your intuitive understanding. And, and and again, in the brain, we have a neural neural model, I guess, right? So I think really the emergent way is kind of the way to go. Um, and then maybe we have to look at what is central to these questions. And so if we look at causality, right? That then, then we know that interventions are a key part, right? And interventions are fundamentally about interaction, right? And so so maybe we cannot do anything with a you know, static agent, which is living just in our, our memory, right? Maybe we need some, some really agent who's actually interacting with some kind of environment. They having also multiple modalities as, as, as a sensoric input, right? Having some kind of body. Um, but I think more importantly, really just the interacting part. And if you have that, maybe given, maybe then causality can emerge as something, right? And, and maybe we don't need objectives. Maybe we need a, an objective less search, right? Like, that's something I've been thinking about recently a lot more. Um, yeah, I, I think that's the way to go. I think you're on the right track there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But but it's also really hard to find such a thing. Since if you want to emerge uh, emerge in those properties, you actually try to design in the rules of, with I say, if if it is a large scale game. Then you have to design and the like the maybe the neurons or representations are players. Then you, uh, then you need to design the rules of this game. However, finding this very accurate rule is is quite hard. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing, right? Because I think what we have to find is 
maybe less rules and constraints, but principles. Because if you think about it, like an analogy, say you're a parent, right? And, and you have your child and you want to teach your child everything, right? And you, you want to give it like all these rules and constraints or whatever, because, you know, you found them useful or whatever, and, and they are causal as well and whatever. But at the end of the day, you kind of wanted to discover it on its own in a sense, right? And so, yeah. so, so what you want to do is just set the playing ground, but then let it act, right? And, and it should not be explicit rules to use within the playing ground, but really what defines the playing ground, maybe, right? Yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah, and, and the more constraints, the, I felt the less scaling, you know, the scaling ability uh, is, is uh, the, the, the less scaling, yeah, is also a problem. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Yeah, so I have a question. Yeah. Um, first of all, I'm not working on mirror symbolic like Junja. Actually, I work on graph. So my question maybe is very silly. Yeah, but it's very fascinating to know and talk with a person who's worked with GIF and Beta. I really like the papers. Yeah, and about the second approach, you use a causal graph. But I, I thought a causal graph sometimes they may have some really tricky cases. Let's say I, I have like a causal graph that have um, like a loop, uh, like chicken and egg, like chicken lay egg and egg will head back to chicken. How, how, would, how can a model uh, learn this kind of relationship? So, so, so first of all, it's, it's, it's not a silly question. It's a very deep question. And secondly, um, they don't. <laughs> the answer is very simple. So, so actually, uh, Perlian causality theory classically is grounded in directed acyclic graphs. So the A, the acyclic, right? So, so you don't even have these graphs because of exactly these problems. Um, and because DACs are very nice for proving a lot of nice theorems. Um, only recently, though, there has been work by, again, some colleagues from Amsterdam um, who, you know, are looking at, you know, mathematically at the foundations of cycles and structural causal models. And while they have, you know, identified some formalism, it's still, it's not what you kind of would have hoped for, because what you get is, okay, you, you can allow for cycles and the formalism, but you cannot do anything about it practically, really. That's what it's saying, unless it's a very simplistic case. And so, um, yeah, I don't know whether we resolve the chicken and egg problem. Um, but yeah, so for the graph, graph neural networks ones, for instance, you simply don't, don't look at them, right? I mean, in graph neural nets, you, you have like the self loops and everything, right? Just to, 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 you know, have your own state remembered. But other than that, that's that nothing is happening there, unfortunately. Yeah. Difficult problem, very difficult problem. I see. Thank you. Well, um, let me ask uh, just a more simplistic uh, or uh, administrative questions where um, there, I don't know whether you knew, but we're actually on a spring break. So a lot more people would have come today, uh, except some of them are, I think, out at the beach or someplace much more <laughs> than New Hampshire. Um, uh, is, your, um, is your slide uh, uh, shareable? Maybe? Yes, yes, and, please. Uh, so, share? At least, you yes. know, we're not, we won't put it on eBay or anything like that. It's just uh, internally, we'll just share on our um, uh, so if you don't mind sending it to Junya so that he, he can sort of share it with the group, that would be great. I, I think this is a um, really fascinating area. And, and you know, as, as an advisor, I'm, I'm really happy uh, that Junya found someone uh, who's just as passionate and ardent about this line of research. So that's really good. Um, you know, I'm, I'm super stoked and grateful about that. Um, but... At the same time, I think that you're right. This is a really, um, I mean, we really have to um, uh, stand on the shoulders of uh, Judea Pearl and uh, Don Rubin and uh, um, because it is a, a deep uh, um, question uh, uh, field. So I, I really hope that this is just the beginning of, of um, sort of a, a collaboration that Junyang will have with you and we will have with you and your group. So. 
Yeah, so hopefully we'll uh, continue to, uh, um, you know, continue to unravel some of these mysteries together. I think that would be really exciting. So thank you so much for the kind words. Um, yes, I'm totally open for that. And I know my advisor and my people are as well. Uh, uh, I think uh, just from the impression I've got, uh, you seem like a cool group. Uh, and again, also who are passionate, which is amazing. Um, again, thanks for the invitation. Um, yes, I will share the slides right uh, after this talk. And um, also, uh, please, uh, you know, share also the recording with them, right? So so if, if they feel like, you know, they're interested, they, they can also rewatch it, right? So so with that, they don't have missed anything and they can still enjoy spring <laughs> break. So, so yeah, I think that's Yeah, nice. thank you so much. And uh, I want to once again highlight the fact that you are five, five or six hours ahead. So uh, we should really let, we should we should not uh, overstay our welcome so we should let you go but yeah let's thank the speaker one more time and thank you and you know four stars for and kudos for all that you have done for us thank, thank you, you so much so before i leave you i just want to give you also some kind of short announcements right oh, so wow. you know something you you might be actually interested in so okay. uh you know want to discuss more following of course we can wow. you know I mean, you know, we, you know, can in, in smaller groups anyhow discuss and for collaborations, and I'm totally down for that. Um, but actually, we also have like this uh, discussion group on causality. So for everyone who's really interested in causality wow. um, in any kind of way, right? Be it you, you want to integrate it, be it because you're purely interested, be it you just want to find out about it. Um, it's a weekly group, which is, you know, open access to everyone. And it's in the morning for you guys. And as you can see, like there's already a lot of members. So you can simply join via this link. So I just want to, you know, let you, you guys in on this so that you're aware. Um, wow, and, and actually, great. we also have the recordings there, which is really nice. So we have had oh, amazing wow. people on there. And so anything which you find interesting, just check it out, right? So, so there's a good chance that any nice causality paper you've seen might be on here. And so you can just watch yeah. the recording. And the cool thing is because it's also like today more informal, right? You know, we can have, you know, questions and, and these things, you know, which dig deeper into the papers. Um, that, that is great. Yeah. And, and also one more thing. So as you have already mentioned, right, Ruben, but, you know, Pearl, uh, Miguel Enan, there's many people involved in causality. And so, so one thing, given that I'm very passionate about causality is I've done this with a colleague of mine, this like genealogy. <laughs> so by no means it's complete, right? But it's kind of, for everyone who's kind of new to this and confused, just check yeah. it out. You'll find some names, right? Um, and and really, you know, if you have someone on there who's not there, then please go ahead and you know extend this. So, um, wow, this yeah, that was great. just just a quick announcement from from my side on that one. And uh, with that, I'm 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 really also uh, done for today. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks Thank for you. Thanks for having me. Have a good evening. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.